time you've given us here in your house. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would bless your people, Lord. They've come to hear your word. So I pray, Lord God, my uh, voice uh, will hold up. And, Lord, that it wouldn't interfere with, with the hearing of your word. And, God, we thank you for those who are here. And, God, have mercy on those that are hurting. Lord, we pray uh, and thank you for these beautiful children you brought into the world. Uh, uh, to, to our church family just a couple of days ago. We pray your blessings on mama and child as well. And Father, we thank you for the visitors you bring, brought us this morning. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that we can be a blessing to them. Now we ask now, Holy Spirit, that you'll have your way in our services. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep my voice really low and try not to strain it too bad. And they're going to try to keep me enough volume here that, uh, that uh, you'll be able to hear me. I think we'll be fine, okay? Ephesians chapter 2. Now, for many weeks, uh, we have been learning about the kingdom of God. We've been learning about the domain where the Lord Jesus Christ rules and reigns. And uh, you and I are a part of that kingdom. You and I are kingdom people we have a king and our king holds the power uh, over our hearts and over our minds if we will let him and one of the most important things that we can learn is the fact that the kingdom is otherworldly in other words it's not of this world it's not like this world and it's eternal unlike this world that will go away someday the kingdom of God will never go away Another fact that we have to consider is that the principles and the laws of God's kingdom are paradoxical, if you will. They, they, they run totally contrary to the laws of this world. Once again, I'll tell you, the world teaches us to hate our enemies. And the word of God or the kingdom of God says, love your enemies. This world tells us that uh, we have to hold on to this life at any cost. But the kingdom of God tells us, lose your life and you will gain it. This world tells us, push your way to the top. And the kingdom of God tells us that the way to the top is by serving on the bottom. So it's totally contrary. It's, it's upside down living when you and I serve King Jesus. And there's no better way to please him than for you and I to learn the ways of his kingdom to learn the laws of his kingdom and, and get serious about them and live by them just like we would obey the traffic laws in, in this world we live in, take them serious, live by them by and large, okay? Uh, the same way with, with his kingdom, okay? So we've learned already that humility is the way of the kingdom. We also learned that uh, usefulness is the way of the kingdom. And, and then the last time we were together, we learned that generosity is the way of the kingdom. So today, this morning, we're going to learn about what may be the crown jewel, if you will, of all of these. And it's this, grace. Grace is the way of the kingdom. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Now, the, that's the first line of the number one hymn in all history. Amazing grace. And that first line nails it with one word, amazing. When a person truly begins to wrap their mind around the true meaning of grace, we cannot help but deduce that it's amazing. Grace is amazing. Let me give you a quick testimony about myself. In my early years of Christianity, I, uh, I was saved, I knew I was saved, and I was excited about serving the Lord, and I quickly began to experience the life-changing power of the Holy Spirit in my life. God's Word had become a source of inspiration in my life. It was a place of discovery, a place of excitement. Uh, it was the spiritual nourishment, nourishment that I needed to grow by, but... I was still a fallible man, just like all of us are. After we become Christians, we're still fallible. I had baggage. I had, uh, uh, I had, uh, 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 I lived in an unredeemed body, had an unre unredeemed mind. And so the result of that is, is I would fail, just like all Christians fail. And 
uh, you and I, no matter who we are, we can still fail, and we will fail from time to time, okay? So in those early years, though my failures were not what somebody would consider major, they were just sins nonetheless, okay? When I would sin, it would frustrate me so much. And I, I really began to beat myself up, and, and I'd get down about it, about my shortcomings. And it would steal my joy. And, 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 and it's, it's important that we, we, we feel bad about doing wrong, okay? That's natural. And it's, 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 uh, uh, there's a certain amount of guilt and a certain amount of shame that should go with doing wrong. But when we're trying to serve the Lord, and it's not rebellion, it's just simple human weakness, okay? We have to learn to confess those failures and then move on. We can't let it hold us down, okay? So in those early years of walking with the Lord, I had a real hard time doing that. I mean, I was just, it, it just, I would get down, I would get disheartened because I wanted to please the Lord. I wanted to do well as his child, but, uh, but I kept, you know, again, falling short. And so finally I went and talked to my pastor, Brother Rob Seal, which till this day is one of my best friends on the planet. We talk every day. I went and talked to Brother Rob and told him my struggles. And with one word, he solved my problem, grace. Grace. Now, naturally, he used other words to explain to me how grace plays out in the life of us as believers, okay? But that one amazing concept, grace, was the key to me overcoming my excessive uh, guilt and shame over my failures. The truth of the matter is, is I already knew about grace, but I didn't yet know how amazing it was. You see, so when I failed, I felt down. I felt unworthy. And the truth is, on our own, we are unworthy. Every one of us is unworthy. But we didn't receive our salvation because we were worthy. We received our salvation because it's a free gift, a gift from God. And so a better understanding of that helped me to overcome those struggles with guilt and shame over my failures. So now, before we go any further, and we're getting along pretty good here. It's good for me. I don't know. Probably terrible for y'all listening. <laughs> but uh, we're going we're to stay hooked, okay? Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, again, let's go ahead and read our text. It's in verse 8. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, Amen. not of works, lest any man should boast. These words were written by the Apostle Paul. Now, in our New Testament Bibles, you find 155 references to grace. 130 of them were the Apostle Paul using those references, okay? Grace defined Paul's life. And really, it could and should define our life, if we truly understand it. By grace are we saved. So let's, let's zero in on that for just a moment. We did absolutely nothing to gain our salvation. I hope you understand that. When Jesus went to the cross of Calvary to shed his blood for the sins of mankind, he willingly, graciously did it. So so that you and I could be saved, so that you and I could be forgiven of our sins. We didn't deserve that. But it didn't matter that we were undeserving. That's what grace is all about. A simple definition of grace is this, God's unmerited favor. It's to be giving something, to be given something by God for free. Something that God just wants us to have, okay? It's a gift. Now, when you and I give gifts to other people, we're not doing it because we owe them something, right? When we give someone a gift, we're doing it, <clears throat> hopefully, out of love and out of kindness, okay? My birthday was last week. Most all of you failed to give me a gift, okay? <laughs> and because of that, I'm going to make a deal. I'm not going to unwrap the gift you didn't give me, okay? So there. 
But it does come around about the same time every year, for the, so you'll know. <laughs> but we give gifts. Give means give. You give gifts. In the New Testament Greek, the word for give means to grant something out of kindness. Gratuitously, uh, gratuitously and freely, okay? Friends, that's the only way salvation could be. If God had made a way for salvation to be had by earning it, what a mess that would have been. You think about that. If God had set it up where you had to earn your salvation, pride and arrogance would have been on display all around us, okay? One guy would say, oh, I earned my salvation this way. And another guy would say, oh, well, I earned my salvation this way. Another guy would say, I earned my salvation by the time I was five years old. Another guy would say, well, I, mine was four, okay? It would just be this, to just turn into a, a great competition and an arrogance and pride. Folks, I'm telling you, we're all prone to pride. You may or may not know it, but folks, I can strut sitting on a horse, okay? <laughs> pride is in me just like it is almost everybody, okay? And I would not, I know, would not be worth killing if I had earned my salvation. I would probably be the old, most arrogant Christian on the planet if I had earned my salvation. But it's not that way. Our verse here says in verse 9, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. That says it very clearly. God knew that if he allowed us to work for our salvation, that we would compete for his glory. We, there wouldn't be room in heaven for all of us in our big heads, okay, if we work for our salvation. He gave it to us as a gift. Here's what God said. God says, here's what I'm going to do. I love you. I want to be close to you. I want to be in a relationship with you. But because of your sin, that can't happen. Because of your sin, because I'm holy, I can't have you in my presence. So, he says, I'm going to make a way for this to happen. I'm going to make a way for the, I'm, I'm going to send my perfect son, Jesus, to live a perfect life and to provide a perfect sacrifice on the cross for your sins. And so Jesus went to the cross for this, with the sole purpose of paying the penalty for the sins of mankind. That's a gift. It's one-sided. It's all God. You and I could not contribute to it at all. The only thing we brought into the deal was our sins. And you can't really call that a contribution. God gave freely, gratuitously, without merit, his forgiveness to you and I. So the question is, is well, how do we receive that gift? How, do we, how, how does that become mine? Well, the Bible says in John 1, 12, to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to those who believed on his name. That, that, that belief is very important, okay? You and I must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We must believe that he died on the cross for our sins. We must believe that he rose again on the third day. It's so important. We have to believe those things, okay? But simple belief is not enough. Simple belief doesn't get it done. Let, let me give you some key verses out of Romans chapter 10, and they'll just put them up on the screen. But Romans 10, 9 says this. It says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Okay? You see, along with the belief, there's some action. Confession. Okay? Confess means to declare or to admit. If we confess our sins to the Lord, we're declaring to him and admitting to him that we know we've done something wrong. Okay? So to confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, we are declaring and admitting to him that we know he is who he says he is and that we know he can save us. Okay? Then you go down to verse 10 of Romans chapter 10, and it says this, For with the heart... A man believeth unto righteousness. 
You see, that explains the kind of belief that you and I have to have. It's a heart belief. A heart belief is a belief that is so real to us that we act on it. It's so real to us and we're so assured of its truth that we take action, okay? Let me give you this illustration and, and maybe it'll help out. Let's say I developed a, a serious disease or condition in my eyes that's causing me to lose my eyesight. It's already hindered my eyesight greatly and it's progressing and they tell me that it's gonna blind me before uh, if something's not done, okay? And then it's brought to my attention that there's an expert doctor in Lubbock that is capable of fixing my eyes, okay? And I'm provided with testimony after testimony of people who have gone to him and have successfully received their eyesight back, okay? Now, with me being in that condition and hearing that news, there's one of three ways that I could respond to that, okay? The first way, I could very foolishly just fail to believe it. Say, nah, I, I don't think that's true. I don't think there's any way he can do that. I'm not gonna waste my time with that. And so that's very foolish, and that foolishness would mean that I just didn't receive any help for my side, okay? Continue with the condition that I had. And then there's a second response that we could have. I could believe the reports, know the name of the doctor, know where his clinic is, and, 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 and know how to make an appointment to see him, but just simply say, nah, I don't want to go to that doctor. I, I, I just don't want to fool with it. I, I, I don't want to use that guy, okay? In that case, my eyes still would receive no help, just like the first response. That's what simple belief is like. Simple belief is just having the knowledge of it, but not doing anything about it, okay? Having the knowledge that the doctor is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do, but no response to it, no action. Now, that second response is actually worse than the first. The first response is just ignorance, okay? Just an unwillingness to believe the information. There's a lot of people like that in this world. They just don't believe. They just don't think the Bible's true. They just don't think God is real. They just don't think Jesus was, uh, was, was the Son of God, okay? And, and they just don't think there's any merit to the story, and they just don't believe. That's just unbelief, okay? But to say that we do believe, to say that, that, that we do think those things are true, but not be willing to step out and take any action, that's more foolish than the unbelief. And they both result in the same thing. No help for our condition. No help. In the case of this analogy here, no eyesight. No help for my eyes. In the case of Jesus, no forgiveness for your sins. There's a third response. And it's this. The third response is to believe the reports that I've heard about this particular doctor. And to believe the testimonies of the people who have already been healed by him or, or had their sight corrected. And to call him up and make an appointment, get scheduled, go in, get the operation for my eyes. And in which case my eyesight is restored. It would be a glorious thing. It would be an amazing thing. Now, folks, that is more than simple belief. That's a heart belief. You see, it's a belief that I, I believe enough that I'm going to take action. I'm going to do something about that, okay? That's the kind of belief that results in salvation. There's another word for it, and we find it here in our text in verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. You see, that's what faith is. It's belief that takes action. Faith is belief that is so strong that we do something about it, okay? We have a condition. It's not in our eyes. It's in our heart. We have a condition that there's a remedy for. Something can be done about it, and that condition is sin. 
You've got sin. I've got sin. That's a problem. And there's a man that is capable of dealing with our sin. And the fact is, he's already done the work for it. He took care of, Jesus took care of that on the cross. His cleansing blood has already been shed. The penalty has already been paid for sin. And forgiveness is already available, okay? We may believe all that, but we have to take action if we want to be saved. We have to the, come to the place in our life that we realize that we need the salvation that God has offered us. The gift has been out there for a long time. We have to reach out and take that gift, okay? Now remember, by grace are we saved. Through faith, okay? Grace has offered the gift freely. Faith is just reaching out and taking it. That's our job, okay? Isn't that amazing when you think about it? Free gift of salvation. And all I have to do is believe and reach out and take it. So let's get back to our illustration and I'll be finished. I have this horrible eye disease. It's debilitating. It's, it's impacting my life greatly. I've heard about this great doctor in Lubbock. He has the credentials. He has the experience. He has the know-how to come in and fix my eyes. I believe that. So, I know his name. I know where his clinic is. I've got his phone number. So I call him up. I make that appointment. I go in and I get evaluated. And he says, yes, indeed. You need my surgery. You're exactly right. I can fix your eyes. I can restore your sight. And so with having heard that, I'm relieved. But then I ask the next big question. How much is this going to cost me, Dr. Grace? And his response to me stuns me. He says, it's free. There's no charge at all. And I'm taken back by that. And I say, no, Dr. Grace, I have to pay you something. There's no way I can let you do this surgery and, and change my life so much without me paying you something. And his response is this, there's no way you're going to get my surgery if you try to get it by paying. You just can't have it. I won't do that. Dr. Grace says, I will only perform the surgery if you will let me give it to you by grace. And so he begins to explain to me. When I was young, he says, he realized that there were people out there that had this horrible eye condition. There were people out there with this eye disease, and he saw the effects of the disease upon these people, and it saddened him. And because of that, he says, I'm going to devote my life to getting the proper education and the proper training that I need to be able to go out and do this great surgery and relieve these people of that disease. Relieve them of their misery. Restore their eyesight as they need it. And he says to me, he says, I'm committed to doing that, but I'm only committed to doing it with no cost, without anybody ever paying me. This is my life purpose. So you have come to me because you need my surgery and I'm willing to do it because I want you to have it. That's why I'm proud to say that my name is Dr. Grace. Now, with that being understood, I wouldn't be able to argue with Dr. Grace. All I would be able to do is deduce that I am going for the surgery and he is truly amazing. Amazing. Grace is the way of the kingdom. But it's not just grace. It's amazing grace. Brother David, if you guys want to come. I hope this, this, this illustration is not perfect, okay? It's not flawless. But it pains for you and I 
a very good picture of what God has given you and I. The free gift. We have this condition. It's called sin. He has a way to fix it. He's done all the work. He's, got, he's, he's done everything that needs to be done. But he's not going to let you and I earn it. He's not going to let you and I come to him and offer this and offer that to try to get it. He says, that won't work. He says, the only way you're going to get it is you understand that I'm giving it to you because I want you to have it and I love you. I'm going to ask you to stand. I hope in your hearts, in your minds this morning, that you understand how amazing grace is. If you're here and you don't know that, if you're here and you never experienced that amazing grace, you've never been born again, every Christian in this auditorium at one time came to the same realization. Every born-again believer, including myself, came to that same realization you just came to. And guess what we did? We acted on our belief. And for that reason, and that reason only, we're Christians today. Did you know what? You could say the same thing tomorrow. If you realize how amazing grace and you want it for yourself, you can be saved today and you can be added to the roster of God's children. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If God's spoken to your heart, please come.